When the moon hits your eyes like a big piece of pie, that's a moray. Ladies and gentlemen, gorgeous sunlight here. Welcome back to the Chip Over the Top Rugby Podcast. My name is Ryan. If you're new here, welcome. Hit that thumbs up. Give this video a subscribe to my channel. I would very much appreciate it. And if you've been here before, welcome back. Ladies and gentlemen, what a weekend of rugby we had opening round of the World Cup is ticked off, it is done, but it didn't come just plain and simple, which we kind of expected. There were ups, there were downs, controversial aspects of rugby bringing to a light, uh, inconsistencies. But before we get involved into the negativities, let me just first and foremost say, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for subscribing and watching my content. I'm already at over 250 subscribers uh, and I'm well on the road to 500 and then more. So so thank you first and foremost for that. And um, yeah, over the weekend, I just, it's been a fantastic like spectacle of, of rugby, not only at World Cup level, but you know, we've had uh, domestic leagues starting back up. I had my first game on the weekend, like official league game of the season, which was pretty cool. Give me one second. Mm. That's delicious. And yeah, so as well as that, I've been uh, watching and listening to a lot of punditry, a lot of, a lot of stuff that's happened online. And I've just been watching and listening to kind of the feedback, the reviews of the weekend. And I'm also going to give my opinions as well, because I feel like obviously I am a rugby YouTube channel. And I feel like that is the whole point is to give my opinion. And that's why you you listen. Now, um, lots to cover, a couple notes here. So, yeah, I wanted to kind of bide my time on giving this round one review because... Um, like I said, I've done, I've done a lot of watching and a lot of listening to punditry. I've, I've watched different channels, other YouTube uh, videos and stuff like that. And I wanted to give, I, in an ideal scenario, I'm going to give instant feedback, just like I did with the Fiji Wales game. That was kind of a raw post-match analysis of the game as it unfolded after the whistle. Um, but sometimes that's just not, not possible with, with life and whatnot. So with that being said, let's dive into the Rugby World Cup. Round one, starting with the opening ceremony. Now, I didn't get to watch the opening ceremony initially because the feed in America, it's Peacock, which is owned by NBC. And for some reason, they had the France-New Zealand game, which I watched, but they didn't have the World Cup ceremony, which was kind of annoying. The opening ceremony is pretty cool. I always enjoy it. And it just opens things up nicely. And so I had to watch it on YouTube, on the Rugby World Cup website, uh, site, sorry, on their channel. And I thought it was absolutely incredible. It was very, very well done. And it just led into that game so well. And uh, speaking of that game, France opening up against New Zealand. I think France were odds on favourites going in and it just showed the home advantage, just how they played, how they came together. There's some outstanding performances across the board. And New Zealand just didn't show up. And they had a couple last minute changes. I know Sam Kane was out, um, which could have maybe disrupted the flow of things. And I think Adi Savea stepped up as captain. Um, and then you had obviously Barrett wasn't involved. Um, so yeah, a lot going on. So let's dive into the... Um, the weekend results and I personally don't think there were that many shocks upsets uh, but there were a few surprises and we're gonna get into that now so obviously France beat New Zealand 27 points to 13 opening up their home opening World Cup game with a win uh, Italy no surprise beating Namibia 52 points to 8 no surprise again, Ireland pulling up 82 points against Romania and they only scored eight points. But touching on that game, first try by Romania, shock. Um, it was their fly half. Uh, I think Johnny Sexton dabbed in behind the line uh, and their fly half was back there waiting to receive and he just picked it up, scooped it up. Boom, had the speed to go down the wing, give a little pop pass to his scrum half. Scrum half was underneath the post, but I believe... 
he missed the conversion, which was slightly odd considering it was right in front of the posts. Um, next up, we had Australia uh, putting on a good performance against Georgia. I think Georgia did well given the situation and the circumstances. Some standout performances uh, for Australia and and Georgia. To be fair, the uh, is a Gregor Shilly, uh, Bika. Greg Ashavili, the uh, the prop that came on, the replacement, he played well. Uh, but then for Australia, you had uh, Tupo, uh, Angus Bell played very well. Uh, I thought Will Skelton did well. Uh, he carried the ball a lot, tackled a lot, uh, was involved in some big turnovers. Uh, and then from the back, Ben Donaldson, just an outstanding performance at fullback. Obviously, given the situation, he was playing up against Georgia, um, but he just was a, was a class act. Uh, and he, I think Eddie Jones might have found a replacement fullback in Ben Donaldson. And then that uh, to round off Saturday's game, we had England against Argentina. Now, that was a game and a half. Uh, 27 points to 10, England beating Argentina. That was, I think, a surprise for a lot of people, myself included. Um, because initially, obviously, the Tom Gurry incident, we're going to get onto that in a second. But... Once that happened, obviously England were down 14 players for 70 plus minutes of that game. And Argentina being the team that they are playing in the rugby championship week in, week out against Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. I thought Argentina were going to be like, all right, this is our chance here, lads. Let's, let's put a nail in the coffin and absolutely rinse England. But that was not the case. England surprised me. And I think a lot of other teams and other people and punditry around the world. Now, obviously, uh, you could argue Argentina didn't play well, uh, which is which is true. But England just, um, well, I say England, George Ford, but it wasn't just George Ford, was it? I think Alex Mitchell played a very good game. Um, Genge played very well. Courtney Laws, excellent. Earls had to step up and Laws had to step up because they had to cover both facets. Manu uh, Tuolagi put in a big hit on Chocobaras, I think, opposite number. Uh, and it was just a good, very good game. Drop goal galore. George Ford played his, like, absolute best game ever, probably. He just, he was like, right, that's it. We're gonna, I'm gonna drop goal and win us this game. And uh, he did. And then on the weekend, uh, rounding off on Sunday, we had Japan versus Chile. Japan beating Chile 42 points to 12. Now, I do think that scoreline does not reflect Chile's performance. Uh, it was close at halftime. Uh, I think there were some outstanding performances from Chile. And I think that scoreline uh, gave a harsh account of kind of how into the game they were. For the vast majority of it, it was just the last kind of quarter where they slipped off and Japan just kind of built their lead. But I think that game was closer than the scoreline meets. Uh, South Africa, Scotland. South Africa beating Scotland 18 points to three. Uh, that was not necessarily a surprise, but it was just a shock of how they did it. They didn't let Scotland play at all. Uh, and there was a couple of key performances in, in influencing that. Uh, Steph Dutois. Franco Mostert just disrupting the rucks, the lineouts, the set piece. Um, Manny Leboc, Sir Khaleesi, Faf had a great game. Uh, Cheslin Colby had a great game, but just Scotland just couldn't get front football. Uh, and when they did, they didn't. It didn't amount to anything. Hence the scoreline. And then my personal favourite game of the weekend, rounding off Wales v Fiji. What a fucking game that was! Wales coming away with a win, thirty-two points to twenty-six. Um, and that had everything in it. It had excitement, it had controversy. We love controversy here. Uh, we, I mean, we don't because it, it builds a lot of online noise, but it was, it was an incredible, incredible game. Uh, and I think a lot of people, obviously I'm from Wales, right? Welsh flag, Welsh top here. A lot of people had written off Wales going into the World Cup, uh, especially off the back of the uh, South Africa performance, where South Africa just dismantled Wales, a couple of interception tries, etc. But uh, a lot of people had written Wales off, and this was a big game. Fiji were favourites, even though on paper they weren't. In everybody's minds, Fiji were favourite. And uh, at the end of the day, Fiji just didn't capitalise. They had 17 points uh, penalties awarded to them. 
uh, on, you know, Wales conceded 17 penalties. Fiji didn't capitalise. Uh, we could go on and on and on. I know there was the infringements and the, the issues, and we're going to get onto the controversy right now. But what a performance and a game that was. I think Wales stepped up and Fiji stepped up. Obviously, no one's talking about Wales because a lot of people are arguing that Fiji were robbed, but they just didn't. They did enough to win, but they just didn't. So I will leave that there. But now we're going to move on to the controversies because there was quite a few this opening weekend. First and foremost, starting from the top, uh, controversies surrounding the anthems, the, the child choir. Not entirely sure about that personally. Um, I much prefer just the crowd singing and, you know, uh, bringing in bands maybe. Uh, that would probably be the thing. I, and I know the World Cup are now allowing the teams to select which option they go for. So we'll see on that. Uh, there was a couple of instances, I believe, I read online. I didn't, I didn't know this until yesterday where a couple of uh, the games were very difficult to attend in terms of there was some issues with transportation. But don't forget, this is a worldwide event. So there's going to be far more people attending in person uh, and there's just going to be more people there. Uh, so I think England-Argentina game, there was a couple of issues and maybe Ireland, possibly, there was a couple of issues getting to the game um, or getting into the game. Not entirely sure what happened, but uh, I think that's all resolved. Just unfortunate, obviously, opening game um, and people pay good money to attend. Uh, and then, yeah, officiating was probably the big controversy. There was there was some red cards, yellow cards, uh, inconsistencies across the board, starting with uh, the Tom Curry, uh, Jesse Creel, the, the Japan player. Um, There's a couple of instances in the Welsh game, for example, where there were head-on-head -head contacts, um, but nothing sort of came about it. Um, and so Tom Curry's got upgraded to a red, for example, but the Japan's, the Japanese players um, didn't. It stayed a yellow. Jesse Creel wasn't investigated at all, whereas that was very similar to the to the Tom Curry incident. So there's just there's just inconsistencies, and I think a lot of people online, and myself included, are just wanting to have uh, a clear, concise understanding because obviously I play rugby as well and I know a lot of people don't but a lot of people are still invested and involved in the game of rugby so it'll be nice to have like a clear understanding this is an absolute yellow card this is an absolute red card and there's no debate of it being upgraded or not from yellow to red and I think that will clear things up nicely and hopefully there's not going to be that many more incidences coming in this World Cup because we want to try and put on a spectacle at the end of the day this is the Rugby World Cup it has been shown around the world to millions uh, lots of millions and millions of The Rock's fans uh, attending in person WWE if you didn't know The Rock there um, and yeah, there was just uh, some officiating differences, you know, between the tier one and tier two teams. But I don't think there was personally. I think um, you could argue, yeah, okay, Fiji were hard done by in the in the twenty two. But I've already touched upon this. The infringements that Wales did were of separate in nature, and the third one was a team penalty. The fourth one was very unfortunate for Fiji, um, but you know, four penalties in in the Welsh 22 and they didn't come away with points. Um, if they had come away and kicked penalties, and I know there's the what ifs and whatnot, then the two or sober try would have taken them into the lead. Uh, but then you could argue then down the other end with the Welsh driving more, that was an instant yellow card because obviously he collapsed it and that's a personal foul. But you could argue then that some of the others at the Wales end were personal fouls. So there's inconsistencies there. And I understand, I do. Um, but I don't think any of those were try scoring opportunities, whereas the Welsh one was. So at the end of the day, look, I'm not a referee. This is just my opinion. Uh, let me know your thoughts below. Give this video a like as well and subscribe if you like the content thus far. Okay, moving on. Uh, some takeaways. Uh, touch upon the anthems. That needs to change. Uh, the fans and the atmosphere, I think, are outstanding. France knows how to party. Even like the, the sort of lesser games, the Chile Japan game had a fantastic atmosphere. Um, right at the build up of the game, you know, the countdown, the fans are involved, they're engaged, it's pretty cool. 
uh, it is hot in France right now, uh, which is kind of leading to uh, a little bit more handling errors. And I've got quality of rugby is not quite 100%. And again, that might just be the heat. Might be first weekend nerves, first round rugby World Cup nerves. Um, although there are, obviously, there's some fantastic displays of rugby. You know, we knew that Ireland and Italy were going to win, for example, convincingly. Um, but in the other game, sort of England-Argentina game, wasn't as what people were expecting. Uh, and the only game that I think people were expecting a good standard maybe was the Welsh-Fiji game. Uh, and hopefully that will change coming up to this weekend coming. But looking at the fixture list, there's only a couple that are, are standouts uh, where there's going to be a good standard of rugby on both sides in terms of it being like a fair, entertaining battle. Uh, and we'll get on to that. Uh, I think the the sportsmanship um, and just the overall showcase of what rugby is as a whole has been pretty good thus far. The only negatives, obviously, some of the officiating. Um, and yeah. So uh, just to round up this video before I go on into round two uh, and touch upon the team selections and whatnot, I want to give uh, my personal team of the week. Now, I know a lot of people have done this. Um, and if you haven't been playing fantasy rugby, then you are missing out. And none of these players, uh, some of these players were in my fantasy team, but it's quite difficult to pick a fantasy team with the points that you're given and then do a team of the week to have like all stars and everything like that. So um, we're going to start with the forwards, going to start with the front row. Um, there's a couple of people who I think could be selected in each position. So let me know your thoughts on your team of the week below. And I'm going to run through this quickly and then we're going to uh, move on to uh, the next video, which you're going to hopefully subscribe and watch next. Uh, starting with the front row, um, I have three three loose heads. I have uh, Andrew Porter for Ireland, Genge for England and Gareth Thomas. And the only reason why I've got Gareth Thomas in there is, is just his tackling performance. Um, and uh, the... The Fiji scrum has become a little bit more dominant recently, so uh, he did very, very well. And I think he got like 20 tackles in that game as well. Um, but probably the standout would probably be Genj for me. Uh, you could argue Porter, but he was going up against Romania. So yes, he's going to dominate his opposition there. But the Argentinian front row are just absolutely strong as anything. And I think Genj... Put in a good performance. Um, Hooker, a uh, couple of notable mentions. Jamie George played fantastic for England. Um, Escobar for Chile did very well. Uh, I was watching that game and he was just all over the place. He was not all over the place as in he didn't know what he was doing, but he was just everywhere. Tackle monster. Um, he had a couple of carries. He was involved in a couple of turnovers. Um, but I think my hooker of the week was uh, Malvaca for France. Uh, he just played absolutely his skin off and did very, very well. Um, and for the tight head prop, I've gone with Tupo. Um, I think Tupo played outstanding against Georgia. But noticeable men uh, mention for Gigashvili, the uh, Bika Gigashvili, the prop that came on and scored the last try for Georgia. I think he did very well. And then uh, Locks. Uh, I've gone with Will Rowlands, 27 tackles, involved in the first big turnover of the game, just set the tone from the off um, and was just everywhere. And he did very well. Uh, and I think he played his skin off. Uh, notable, uh, notable mention for Fremont, the French lock. I think he did very well against New Zealand. Um, and the other lock position, I know you can interchange here so it doesn't necessarily matter what number they were wearing on their back but uh Moster for for South Africa I've already mentioned him um and Will Skelton I think played outstanding uh in the back row um I've got Omani for Ireland again you're going up against a uh, weaker opposition but still played his played his uh uh game probably one of the best performances of him but obviously going up against less than stellar competition so maybe that Will be interesting to see him when they play like South Africa or Scotland. See if he can still still put that in. Uh, Courtney Laws, Peter Steph Dutrois for South Africa, but I think Courtney Laws uh, gets it at six to be honest because of 
just the nature of the game where Tom Curry went off and he had to step up and take on, well, him and Earls had to, you know, carry the back row. They, they were the only two players there for 75 plus minutes. Uh, on the other flank, I've gone with Jack Morgan. Um, again, I just think that he, well, he tackled, he tackled everything that came his way. I don't think he missed the tackle. Uh, the little cross field kick, obviously I'm slightly biased because I'm Welsh, but I think as a open side, I think he just played very, very well. Uh, let me know your thoughts below. Uh, at eight, I've gone with Aldri, uh, up against a, a very good New Zealand team. He, he was just the shining light. He was outstanding in that game. Um, noticeable mentions for Ardi Severe and Luca Canone for Italy. Um, they played well as well. Uh, moving into the backs. Now, there's a couple here that you could pick and choose from. The obvious would be Antoine Dupont. But I also think Faf de Klerk had a great game. Uh, I think Jameson Gibson Park had a great game for Ireland. But again, going up against uh, Romania. Not to, not to put anything against Romania, but... Um, would he have had the same game against, you know, South Africa or Scotland? To be determined, right? Um, but I also think Alex Mitchell for England should get a mention here because he played very well. He started uh, and his link up with George Ford and, and just how he was able to help control that game, um, even though they were one player down, was very good. Uh, fly half. Now, George Ford, out fucking standing player. Uh, he played his hat off on Saturday and uh, obviously scored all 27 points for England. Dominated that game, won it for them single-handedly pretty much. Obviously, I know it's a team effort, but he, he put England on the back and we're like, right, we're going to just drop call our way to, to, uh, to win here. And they did. Uh, noticeable mention for me, though, again, I know I'm Welsh, but damn bigger. My goodness, what a game he had. That 50-22, incredible. And I know you could argue him shouting and, and being very frustrated at the end of this, the first half with them not getting the ball off the park. And look, rightly so, I'm a fly half, believe it or not. I know I don't look like a fly half, but I am. And sometimes that frustration is like, you have to let people know. Um, and I look, I know it's not necessarily the place on the field, but it was like, Getting off, in, you know, it was literally half time, um, and the ref was standing right next to him, and it just picked it up, um, which is unfortunate. But sometimes, if you've played rugby, you know exactly how that feels. Sometimes, uh, left wing, uh, Cheslin Colby played fantastic for South Africa against Scotland. Uh, the Manny Leboc, actually, that was Aaron's. It wasn't Colby, I think, but yeah, uh, Colby just had a. An outstanding game. Notable mention for Josh Adams. Again, I know I'm Welsh, but look, at the end of the day, when you put in that big hit and it leads to a turnover, you score the opening try. Um, defensively, he was good. Um, luckily, he didn't have Tua over opposite him this time round, but, you know, he just played very well and he put his hand up because there was question marks going into this game whether he was the right choice. Uh, whether his form, run of form as of late was was up to par. And it looks like he's hit hit the mark um, from the offset. Uh, and centre centres, I've gone with, uh, look, Bundiaki just played outstanding, right? But again, you're going up against Romania. And so it's going to be a lot easier to break through the line and, and just play how you want to play. Uh, but he played outstanding. I think Nick Tompkins, believe it or not, played very well. Um, going up against a massive centre part uh, in Nyakalevu and Radrada. Uh, they targeted him a couple of times, but he actually put his body on the line. He tackled well. Uh, he was in the right place, set up George North a couple of times uh, and, and just outclassed his opposite number. Um, there's no two ways or ifs or buts. Uh, Radraja did have a fantastic game, and I've got him down here as well. But I think, um, yeah, Bundiaki is probably the number 12 of the round one. Uh, at 13, uh, a couple of players here. Naya Kalevu just played fantastically well for Fiji. He, he carried that team. Um, his passion, his skill set, his running, his power... He broke through a couple of tackles, you know, easy, slipped off 
Uh, I think it was Wainwright and Biggers tackle in the first like 10, 15 minutes. Um, I thought George North played well. Again, showed what he's still capable of. Nip Tompkins putting him through that early break that he made. Uh, and then obviously scoring the tries, slicing in between Radradra and Nea Kalefu. But um, another one, I only for, uh, for New Zealand played very, very well as well. Uh, moving on to the right winger, I've gone with Damien Peno, but notable mention for Capuozzo here for Italy. Uh, played exceptionally well, obviously playing against Namibia, but uh, it was good to see him kind of getting back to where he was previously. And then at fullback, uh, a couple mentions here. Uh, Hugo Keenan, uh, Hugo Keenan, Ireland played very, very well. And uh, Ben Donaldson for Australia, I've already mentioned him. I think they found their fullback moving forward. He played outstanding. Uh, a notable mention for Chile, though, Ayata, I believe that's how you say his name, uh, pro D2 rugby player in France. What a game he had. His, his ability to beat the first contact was outstanding. The fend that he put in, this little sidestep that he made, a couple breaks that he had, I thought he played very, very well. Uh, and I think he'll be a, a good player to watch moving forward. So let me know your thoughts on that team of the week. Let me know your thoughts on round one of the opening weekend of the Rugby World Cup. My name is Ryan. Make sure you hit this thumbs up. Give this video a subscribe and leave a comment. Let me know your thoughts uh, as I am going to be creating a video on round two very, very shortly. So keep your eyes peeled. Dio Peace.